Good evening, and welcome to Restored Lore, your home for old, odd, and obscure stories on YouTube. Tonight's story is Lost and Found, as translated by Jens Christian Bay. This story comes from Bay's Danish Fairy Tales, first published in 1899. This story has everything, from kobolds to the king of the wind to the devil himself, along with some non-traditional gender flipping. It's an interesting folktale. Now, let's open our imaginations and begin. There was once a poor man who walked about in the woods gathering fuel. His wife and children at home were in want of all that was necessary, both to bite and to burn. As he moved about the trees, picking up the dead branches, a stranger came along, who stopped and addressed him. When the poor man told of his miserable condition, and how he could not, even by the hardest work, procure the necessities of life for himself, his wife, and children, the stranger said, Indeed, that is a dog's life, but it will depend upon yourself whether or not your conditions be improved. I may assist you. If you are willing to give me the first thing that you see when you reach your hut, I shall see that you are provided with all that you need for the rest of your lifetime. The man considered this proposition a moment. What I see first, thought he, is generally the old jack in the clearing in front of the house. He may have that if he cares. I can easily make another. So he closed the bargain, and they separated. The poor man approached his house, thinking how well it would be when all the small mouths, which were so often clamoring for bread, could be filled with good things, and the little cheeks become as rosy red as they ought to have been long ago. He stooped forward, bending his head under the heavy burden of the wood, when suddenly a merry voice called, Papa! There is Papa! Lifting his head and glancing in the direction of his house, he saw his youngest boy rush along the path to meet him. There was no time to warn the child or keep him back. He had seen him first, and of course he must part with him. It gave him great pain, but when he entered the house and found abundance of everything, he appeared cheerful and unconcerned, and said nothing of the promise which the stranger had received from him. Time passed. The man expected every day to lose his child, but no one came. The little boy gradually developed a wonderful keenness and scholarship. In school he could be taught nothing that he did not already know, so at length he was allowed to stay home, where he read and wrote diligently, paying visits to both the blacksmith and the minister, the two learned men in this part of the country, who loaned him all sorts of queer books. On his thirteenth birthday the boy told his father that he knew all about the agreement with the man in the forest. Now, you must take a knife and carve a three-legged chair and a three-legged table for me. The man to whom you sold me was the evil one who has already prepared a seat for me in his dwelling. You must use no other tool than a knife and have these two articles ready before my next birthday. The evil one's table and chair will become smaller and smaller as you carve mine, and when your work is finished, they will have vanished entirely. His father at once went to work, cutting and carving diligently, and when the year came round, the chair and table were finished. On the boy's fourteenth birthday, the two went into the woods. Here, the boy made a circle on the earth, bidding his father seat himself within it, for as long as he stayed there, no one could hurt a hair of his head, and if he remained there one whole day, he would be free. The evil one would have no power over him. It is much more difficult with me, said the boy. Although the evil one cannot cross the circle which I shall draw around myself, I must stay there until a beautiful maiden is willing to save me. She must come and carry me away with her. But until the news of my fate can reach the world and she can be found, I must stay within the circle. Otherwise, I shall become the property of the enemy. 
leaving his father in the circle which he had drawn around him he went away a short distance and drew another placing the table and the chair within it and seating himself on the chair he read diligently in a book which he had placed on the table before him soon lucifer came walking along the man had not known him before but this time he was in no doubt as to who he was stopping near the father the enemy said now the time has come for you to fulfil your part of the agreement go and take the boy if you can replied the man i have brought him along he is not far away lucifer went to the boy stopped near the circle and said come here you belong to me take me if you can was the answer the evil one reached after him but to no effect he could not grasp him and it was impossible for him to cross the circle at length he returned to the father and tried to coax and scare him away from his retreat but all in vain and when he had run back and forth between the two for a considerable length of time he finally lost his patience and walked away in twenty-four hours the father was at liberty to leave his circle and return home but the boy remained where he was awaiting the time when a beautiful maiden should come and save him at length as the news of his cruel fate reached far and wide a fair young princess who lived in a palace south of the sun west of the moon and in the middle of the wind determined to rescue him she came driving in a golden carriage stopped in the forest where the boy sat reading and told him to enter and sit beside her he complied and away they drove far away from the place where the enemy had played his pranks when they arrived at the wonderful palace south of the sun west of the moon and in the middle of the wind he received a place among her servants and finding him both good and true she determined to marry him the young man could not however forget his old home he told his fair young princess that if she would allow him to return for a short time to see how his parents were he would be better prepared to live far away from them during the rest of his lifetime he was longing to see his mother once more no doubt she missed him and shed many tears for his sake thinking she would never see him again the princess was pleased and said it shall be as you desire i will bring you home and you may stay there until you long for me take this ring when you wish to return turn it but do not wish me to come to you in that case we shall both become unhappy upon this they entered the golden carriage again and drove on as rapidly as thoughts can travel until they reached the small hut in the forest as soon as the young man alighted the carriage disappeared and had not the ring been gleaming on his finger he would have thought it all a dream when he entered his old home his parents were much astonished to see him they had of course thought him dead long ago he told them what had happened and how well he had fared and they wondered much at his good fortune it was their greatest desire to see the fair princess who had rescued him and they were never tired of asking him to call her that they themselves might thank and admire her he answered again and again that this could not be that the princess had forbidden it as they could not restrain their desire however and as he was himself anxious to see her he at length turned the ring on his finger wishing her to come at once the princess appeared snatched the ring away from him boxed his ears effectively and vanished as rapidly as she had come now he stood there deprived of his happiness and all means of returning to her as he could not remain at home he bid his parents good-bye and set out to seek his lost happiness he walked a long distance and at length lost his way entirely one day when he stopped to rest in the depths of a large forest he noticed a couple of kobolds quarrelling about something what are you quarrelling about asked he well they had found a pair of slippers which would enable their owner to cover ten miles at one step each of them wanted these and each said that he had found them no use to quarrel about that said the young man 
Each of you may take one and cover ten miles in two steps. But such a plan did not suit them. Well, said the young man again, I propose that you race as far as the large stone yonder. He who returns first may have the slippers. They agreed upon this and started, raising the dust like a cloud behind them. When they returned, they found the young man and the slippers had both disappeared. The kobolds looked at each other and were sensible enough to understand that this was the easiest way in which to settle the dispute. The young man now rapidly pursued his way. Towards evening he stopped at the gate of a large and magnificent palace. Upon his inquiry who lived there, he was told that the Wind King was the owner of this stately mansion. No doubt, thought he, the Wind King can tell me where the palace south of the sun, west of the moon, and in the middle of the wind is situated. He entered and requested an audience of the king. When taken into his presence and inquiring about the palace which he was seeking, he was told by his majesty that the location of the palace was altogether unknown to him. Towards evening, all the winds were, however, to return home. He, the king, would ask if any of them knew of such a place as the palace south of the sun, west of the moon, and in the middle of the wind. Some one of them would be likely to know. Towards evening there was a whistling and howling around the palace, and when all the winds had taken their seats in the large hall, the king entered, inquiring if all were there. Someone replied that the northwest had not yet arrived, but that he must soon come. A few minutes afterwards the northwest came howling through the gate, pushed the doors open, and fell into his seat with a loud crack. Do you know a palace which is located south of the sun, west of the moon, and in the middle of the wind? inquired the king. All shook their heads except the northwest, who nodded gravely and gloomily, and said that he had passed it occasionally, but it was very, very far away. The king now told him to carry a young man with him the next morning, but the wind replied that a young man who could only walk on the ground would never reach the place. He himself could not carry such a burden. It would detain him too much, and he would never reach the end of his journey. The king replied, however, that there was no help for it. He was to take the young man along with him the next morning, whether he wished to or not. Next morning, the northwest looked, if possible, still more gloomy than the evening before. He did not like to keep company with a walking person, but, as the king's orders must be obeyed, he moved very slowly in order to keep pace with his companion. The latter was, however, very soon so far ahead that the wind was obliged to quicken his steps considerably, but the farther they came, the more rapidly he had to move, and at length he became a tremendous tempest. About noontime they reached the palace, but the northwest had become so tired that he was obliged to rest under a tree while the young man put off the slippers. He walked the last part of the way without slippers, otherwise he would have passed without seeing it. When he entered the palace, the princess received him gleefully. She had never dared to think that he would ever be able to reach her again. Their wedding was celebrated in a gorgeous manner, and they are living yet happy and contented, in their beautiful palace, south of the sun, west of the moon, and in the middle of the wind. The best sentence in this story is, of course, the kobolds looked at each other and were sensible enough to understand that this was the easiest way in which to settle the dispute. What an unusual story. If you've been following this channel for a while, or you're simply familiar with European fairy tales and folklore, you'll recognize a lot of these story elements. It's interesting that they do seem gender-flipped in this story. I feel like it's usually women and girls who agree to give away the first thing that they find for something or another. And of course, it's almost always women and girls who are trapped somewhere waiting to be rescued. I think that bit is especially interesting because it's usually a beautiful princess who is trapped somewhere waiting to be rescued, and the reward for rescuing her is that you get to marry her and inherit the kingdom. 
You may not have noticed, but the story says twice that he is trapped in the circle until a, quote, beautiful maiden, end quote, should come rescue him. So I guess that means that he would turn away ugly sluts and he would just stay in the circle? But there's also no apparent incentive for such a beautiful maiden to come rescue him. She doesn't seem to get anything for doing it, even though she does later decide to marry him anyway. The bit where he wants to go home from paradise and visit his mom and he has the magic amulet, it's all very reminiscent of Yoroshima Taro, where the exact same thing happens. Of course, Urashima turns to ash and he dies, and in this story instead, the princess boxes his ears, which is hilarious, but also not okay. Gender flipping does not make relationship violence okay. Quick side note for emphasis, gender flipping does not make relationship violence okay. It is never okay. So, this story marks the first appearance on the channel of a kobold. I admit that really my only prior familiarity with kobolds is from D&D, of course, so I did think that they were some kind of goblin. But when I looked it up, in fact, a kobold is a traditional German house spirit. In fact, in the original Danish story, they probably used the term nise instead of kobold, since they describe the same kind of creature. Traditionally, kobolds lived in the house with the family, often in or near the hearth, but sometimes in empty corners in the attics and the stables. The most common type of kobold is also known in Low German as a chodeken, or the Dutch kabouter, and these are all references to the famous little pointy hat. So, these creatures have had such an incredible fall from grace. They were probably originally derived from the Roman lares. Romans kept these domestic gods as these kind of household gardens, and they were probably relics of... Uh, ancestor worship or early domestic pagan rituals. The Romans seem to have borrowed them from earlier Etruscan religious practices. So these little figures had a well-kept little shrine in the house, and they would be brought to the table for meals, and they would be brought out for important occasions like births and weddings and deaths. They received care and offerings, and they granted the family protection and good fortune. Early Germanic people also kept little figures like this, and again, they were entrusted with the care and the well-being of the family. Wikipedia says that by the 13th century in the Germanic countries, they were being kept more as um, mementos and pieces of kitschy decor and not as serious subjects of household worship or part of a daily religious practice. But that might just be one interpretation. I mean, it seems to me that they probably originated as some sort of ancestor worship, and so the original spirits of these creatures, the kobolds, the penites, um, would have been specific to that hearth, that house, that family, known to them and invested in their fate. And as time went on, these spirits became less domesticated. They took on a wilder, more mischievous aspect and became associated with nature and with roads or with crossroads, with cats, with snakes. Some became able to shapeshift or to manifest as, you know, fairy lights or fires. So instead of these domesticated spirits that are attached to the health and the welfare of your family in your home, they became these more capricious nature spirits, tricksters, jokesters, wild and unpredictable. So in this story, the kobolds don't seem to be linked to any particular place, and in fact, they seem to want to be able to cover quite a lot of ground. But kobolds have a bazillion forms, and they have a bazillion stories. We will probably explore them further in the future. If you listen all the way to the end of the video, you get to hear me make a little confession. Tonight's confession is that I absolutely fell in love with Odense, which I still can't quite say correctly. Uh, in Danish, you ignore most of the letters in a word. But the city is compact, it's cute, it has tons of events and culture, charming shops, cozy cafes. It's very convenient to Copenhagen, but it has everything in itself. And none of that would have sounded very exciting to me 20 years ago, but now it sounds extremely appealing. But I also feel that way every time I go to Denmark. I always come back wanting to live in Denmark. I also tend to fall in love with lots of places and imagine how wonderful it would be to live there. So part of it is just the kind of romance of travel and exploration. 
is a little, you know, grass is greener syndrome. No, I do think that there are a few ways that Denmark is actually better than the Netherlands. But I also think the two countries are on a similar spectrum. So to me, the differences are more matters of degree rather than complete differences. At any rate, I have many possible futures ahead of me. Living in Denmark is a highly improbable one. As much as I love it there, I do have other flames to fan at the moment. If you like to fan the flames of old and overlooked literature, you've come to the right place. Please subscribe to the channel and opt into notifications so you never miss a story. Also, uh, drop a like or a comment on this video. It really does help the channel get discovered and continue to grow. Thank you so much for listening, you guys. See you in a few days.